This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. Sex trafficking right here in the U.S. has become so widespread, it seems almost impossible to stop it. Well, today we'll meet a pastor whose church has become a leader in our nation, helping to bring young women back into society after being rescued. And no one is more surprised at the impact of the church in Georgia than its pastor, Aaron Gable. With some land, a church member with a heart to give, and a whole lot of love, they've created a tiny village for the restoration of former sex trafficking victims. What he wanted to do was to address a horrendous issue going on not just in the Atlanta area, but all over the country right now, and that's the sex trafficking of young women, that somehow your church was going to help rescue these women out of this lifestyle. Yeah, uh, when our church began, um, somehow we got in contact with an organization called Wellspring Living, and they were... um, letting us know some of the statistics on the sex trafficking industry, specifically in Atlanta, we had never heard of such a thing. Mm -hmm. Um, Certainly historically, most of us have understand that there's prostitution and, um, and how that goes on in in city life and throughout the world even. Uh, But there was something that we were unaware of, and that was how minors, uh, young women were actually being uh, treated as sex slaves um, and the average age of these women was 14 years old. 14. Now that means there were several of them that were younger than 14. Absolutely, which is uh, just shocking, mm-hmm. uh, appalling, um, and it gripped our hearts immediately when we heard uh, some of those statistics and learned that this wasn't just an issue in um, in a urban area. Um, This was actually um, in Atlanta, um, and statistically 65% of the men participating uh, in this uh, horrendous industry were actually from the suburbs um, where we lived, and we just could not believe that this was actually happening um, with people who lived in our county, in our neighborhood, in our city, Uh, and Atlanta ranked as the... uh, as the under, unfortunately, the number one uh, sex trafficking industry in the country, uh, which blew us away. We could not believe that this was happening in our area. And, and sometimes you, it's hard to get your head around something that horrendous. And then you think, well, yeah. God, what do you want us to do about it? There's nothing we can really do about it. What, what's, yeah. what, what's, he, what's he brought before the church? Well, we felt that way because we felt so ill-equipped. So we were looking at Um, Well, we're not counselors. We don't know how to run a rehab program. Um, How do we uh, practically help? And that's where a unique vision came into play from one of our members of the church. A builder in our church, um, he builds. And so uh, he builds custom homes and uh, he's very creative. Uh, He's helped us with several small construction projects at the church. And he made a phone call. He knew of uh, the organization. Uh, that was rescuing and restoring these girls. And he called them up uh, a couple of years ago and just said, hey, I'm a builder. Do you need me to build you something? Well, we don't have an immediate need on our current campus and facility, but we do have an idea we want to throw your way. Have you ever heard of something called a tiny house village or or any tiny houses? Um, And it's obviously uh, he said, yeah, absolutely. I've heard of tiny houses. What did you have in mind? And they said, well, we think that the girls that are uh, rehabbing through our program, once they graduate, they have jobs, they've been educated, they've gone through an extensive rehabilitation program, but there is a missing piece to our program. And that is to find a place that is a safe place, uh, an affordable place where they can stay as they begin their new life and new career on their own. Mm -hmm. And so that's where... Uh, kind of the idea and the vision was birthed between this conversation that one of the builders who's a member in our church has with this organization who's rescuing and restoring girls. And they kind of put their heads together and came up with this idea, let's build a tiny house village. And and that's kind of uh, an idea that was introduced to us about two years ago. 
But you think a tiny house village, you're going to bring all of these girls onto the church property. You're going to build a village of these small houses. And are we equipped to take these people under our wing in this way? We had a lot of questions because we definitely felt like this is so far out of our uh, area of experience. Mm -hmm. No one in our leadership had any kind of expertise on this. But what we did have... um, uh, we did have some property that wasn't being used. We had a builder who knew how to build, and we had a congregation who was uh, very willing and open to do whatever they could to help these young women. And that was enough for us to say, well, why not try? Let's <laughs> go ahead and try this and, and let's move forward. We had a high level of trust with the organization that we supported um, that was rehabbing the girls. Because we had known them for um, eight years uh, plus, and uh, we thought, well, man, this is maybe an opportunity that we've been waiting for of a very tangible way that we can be involved in helping to continue that restorative process for these young women. This is the story of of what's happening right now in, in near Atlanta, Georgia where a tiny, tiny house village is being built to rehab girls that have been rescued from sex traffic. With me now is Pastor Aaron Gable. His church has taken the lead in this because it happens to be on your property, doesn't it? Yeah, uh, so it's amazing how things came about. Uh, so the builder has this beautiful plan of how to build this tiny house village. We were in the midst as a church of expanding our parking lot in the, in the back, mm-hmm. and he was helping us with that project. Uh, Meanwhile, as he's trying to move forward on this tiny house village, their initial vision was to talk with the city, see if the city was willing to reallocate, rezone some Mm -hmm. land uh, so they could build that. The city told them, uh, no, that's not going to be possible. Uh, But they were excited about the idea of a tiny house village. We actually had several friends in the city um, that were uh, definitely fans of what we were trying to accomplish, but knew that they had limitations. Mm -hmm. However, they said, there's a caveat to that. A church can build about anything they want to (laughs) on their property. And if the church, if you found a willing partner of a church property, um, we would be glad to help them accommodate that process for them to get all the approvals and permissions that they need. So uh, the builder, who's a member of our church, he uh, contacted me immediately after that meeting and said, "Um, well, um, all we need is a willing a church. <laughs> Pastor, um, have I got a deal for you? <laughs> <laughs> so um, he said, I have an idea. I can redesign this parking lot that we uh-huh. are going to build. And I think I can do everything that we want. Um, and he, he actually um, designed it, presented it to us, um, and presented it to the city and all the organizations involved. And, and uh, everyone was in agreement. Everyone was moving forward. And it was obvious that um, that our um, steps of faith, and really, I got to be honest, the builder's faith was much bigger than mine in this. Oh. I was skeptical all along the way. <laughs> well, and, it's, he's a ne- Nehemiah kind of guy. He's going to go out and build, <laughs> build a wall. Um, yeah, I, he, he knew how to do things that there's no way that I would have known as a pastor. I, I can teach the Bible, but I'm not going to yeah. build a, um, a building. And so um, he... Um, he garnered all the support and got everybody uh, uh, the partnerships he needed. And he kept saying along the way, I just sense that uh, God is in this. I just sense that um, everybody keeps saying yes. And every, um, I just feel the favor of God on this. And, and that's what we experienced um, uh, when he would go ask for help uh, or permissions from the County or the city, whether it be the government. Um, and it, those aren't easy yeses Mm -hmm. and all of the government officials that he uh, spoke with to get the right permissions to be able to move forward on the project. Um, it went surprisingly fast. It It wasn't only a yes. It was a quick yes. Wasn't he actually, uh, he invested a lot of his own money in this to begin with just to build the model, didn't he? Yeah, he did. So I asked him what his plan was knowing (laughs) that it was not going to be a free thing and he wasn't sitting on a pile of money. Um, and the church was not going to be able to fund this. Um, and so he said, well, I've got enough money to build one model home, which is one tiny house out of the nine that he wants to build. 
So he had saved up his own money, uh, probably, you know, in the, in around $30,000. And um, wow. he he goes ahead and goes forward on the project in faith. And he put his money uh, where his faith was for sure, because he built the first home in faith that the rest would be supplied, that the rest would be provided. What was his projection at that time of the, the, the total cost of what he thought God wanted him to do, what he wanted him to build there on your property? What was the total estimated cost? He was, he was thinking it would probably be around $600,000 uh, to do this entire community. And when I heard that figure, I was like, this might take a long time. I mean, to, to, ever... to raise that money, I mean, if you yeah, got and... fundraise for it. I, that's exactly what I was thinking. And I thought, well, what's your plan uh, to raise this money? That's a lot of money. And I've raised money before, but not for this kind of project. And, mm -hmm. and uh, he told me his plan was to build this model home and ask people for help. <laughs> and, uh, there you go. I said, uh, uh, I said, I gotta be honest. I think that's a horrible plan. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he yeah. He said, well, I just think it's going to work. And I said, well, okay, we'll be patient with the process and see how it goes. And that's what he did. He started asking for help. What, what year did the, the, the building actually start on the property to clear the land and, and to start building yeah. the homes? So he started clearing, we started clearing the land in uh, 2018 um, and probably had the first model home built towards the end of just last year. There's, there's one story in there, uh, as I read this story, uh, about the delivery of the lumber, because it would take a massive amount of lumber, and that's very expensive yeah. these days. Tell me about that story. Well, after he got no's for about three months from different companies, he gets a phone call out of the blue. And this phone call says, hey, um, it's a national lumber company. And they said, hey, we're filming a commercial in Atlanta. We have 40,000 pounds of lumber. Um, we are, when we get done filming this commercial, you can have it all. All you have to do is come pick it up today. Oh, <laughs> that's a lot so, of lumber. There was a great deal. Uh, you know, free is awesome, but if you have no way of getting it, uh, that's going to be a bit of an issue. So he calls a friend of his who has um, a, a truck and a couple of guys, and he said, well, I can send my guys down to go pick it up. So they go pick up the lumber um, and start on their way up all the time. Um, he knows I have no way of even getting it off the truck. <laughs> and so the lumber shows up. This faith. Um, yeah, the lumber shows up in the backyard. Well, there's a construction project going on across the street from the church. And one of our interns comes in and says, hey, they have a forklift. Do you think they'd let us use the forklift? And me and my great faith says, probably not. Uh, they, uh, you know, liability and all the sure. OSHA regulations, there's no way that they'll say yes. But you can ask. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say you can't ask. You can go ask. So he goes across the street and says, hey, we've got to get lumber off the truck. Here's what it's for. And uh, we need a forklift. Can we borrow yours? And they throw him the keys. <laughs> sure. No problem. Sure, take him. Yeah, and, uh, and they get the forklift and, and start unloading the wood, and none of them are expert forklift drivers. It works, and no one gets hurt. The lumber gets, gets off the truck, and, and we have this amazing you know, wow. God moment here where he provides yet again. Yes. Now, now the village is complete. Uh, give us a, just a quick thumbnail sketch of, of what that village really is and what it's going to mean yeah. to these women. So the village itself um, is a gated community of nine tiny homes, uh, five of them being two bedroom homes because some of the young women have children and the other four being single bedroom homes. And they're tiny. I mean, a tiny house is going to be around 400 square foot or less. And uh, it's like a studio apartment. But we wanted to build something that uh, was definitely uh, add dignity to the, to the women that honored them, that was something they'd be proud of to live in. So they're not cheap looking, they're craftsman style, uh, tiny homes. They have a community center, uh, which is a shared facility, much like a community clubhouse mm -hmm. and an apartment complex. And, and that's a shared laundry facility that they have there, shared meeting space, uh, to help continue, uh, with any kind of gatherings that they need. 
And there's also an outdoor pavilion um, that also has storage units mm-hmm. for each of the women that will live there. So it's it's designed a lot like um, any place that you or I would live, uh, whether it be an apartment complex or a uh, um, or even a suburbia housing community. They're just tiny. What what is this going to mean in, in in reality? What is this going to mean to a young woman that's 15, 16 years old, she's been rehabbed, she's looking for a job. What's this yeah. going to mean to her and her life? One of the biggest issues of uh, that they needed wasn't just the safe and affordable housing. It was they need to establish a new group of people okay. uh, that they know. Um, and really what we have to offer, uh, especially as a local church, is a group of people who actually care and who actually will help one another and if we hear of a need of someone, then then we'll make phone calls and leverage the people we know. And that's what we will provide for these young women is, hey, we have uh, several hundred people here, um, thousands of people actually in this community who are available um, just like we would for any of our friends, mm-hmm. uh, but we're available to you and we're your new friends. And so, you know, that's probably not going to happen overnight. We'll have to build some trust there. But at the same time, that's that's the opportunity that they're going to mm-hmm. get uh, really to continue on just like we would want for any of our kids uh, to have a the best start possible at a new life. You're an independent church, but you're, there's a yeah. lot of a lot of denominational churches involved as well. This is what really blew us away that we did not expect. The donations started rolling in from uh, companies and corporations. And I had a moment, I asked the builder, how many? companies and different churches have been involved. And he said, well, if I count all the donations and the labor, there's been well over 200 companies uh, that have given towards this. And if I counted all the churches who donated volunteers and money, mostly volunteer labor, there was over 80 churches involved. And this is 80 churches and 200 companies involved just over the past 12 months or less. So, the news about this spread quickly within our local um, churches, and I can't imagine anything that we could have dreamed up or done <laughs> that would have actually gotten 80 churches to say, yeah, let's do that together. Wow. So it's been, it's been overwhelming. It's been phenomenal. And uh, we did not solicit that, that they really, when a church learned about it or a company learned about it, most of the time they came to us and said, how can we help? Yeah. So what do, you, what do you say to a church as, as a pastor? What do you say to another church that has a resource? In your case, you had the land, you had people with the, with the heart and the vision. What do you say to a church that has a million bucks or they've got the land? And, and how, do they, how do they begin a, uh, to unearth and get their mind around a vision? I think uh, for us, we've tried to document well what is happening. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what we know is um, this could be done somewhere else. Um, really... Uh, we wanted to make sure that we were paying attention to how this was coming together uh, so that if another church, uh, and we've had several churches come to us and say, hey, can we do the same thing on our property? And we said, yeah, actually, um, here's what it's going to take. And the organization called Building uh, Building Hope Communities, they actually now, have a pathway and a process wow. that uh, they could walk with the church and say, um, this is what we know how to do now. We would gladly um, help you build a safe and affordable housing for your community, for whatever group of people might need that. And he's already starting to meet with churches and say, okay, let's start the process. Here's how to do it. What are the changes have you seen in, in your congregation? I mean, besides this builder coming forward, what has it done in your church? Well, you talk about a faith builder. Um, (laughs) People, uh, you know, whenever we give and whenever we serve and whenever we get involved um, and take steps of faith, um, it really has been when Jesus talked about just a mustard seed of faith can move a mountain. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly what we've been able to experience as a local congregation. None of us had this outrageously huge faith other than probably the builder. (laughs) And, and so now you have this collective, massive group of people and organizations that have seen this amazing work, um, and everybody just did a, 
a little part. Yeah. You know, it's it's how you would love to see the body of Christ work and everyone using their gifts and uh, how just a little bit of faith uh, from a lot of people can lead to a very big thing. Well, Pastor, keep fanning the flames of that faith. Keep fan. I'm sure you're going to get a lot of phone calls uh, for people to say, yes, we want to we want to appropriate this this plan and would like to replicate it in other parts of the country. Thank you so much. We appreciate your faith and we appreciate your time. Thank you, Bob. I'm impressed that a small church with a willingness to use the resources they had has drawn the eyes of the country to this ministry. Now, if your church is interested, we have the information below on how you can find out more to get involved. And getting involved is what it's all about. And next I speak with Aaron Bear about why he believes the church needs to get more involved in our own communities. Back with me is Aaron Bear, president of uh, Citizens for Community Values. And you do a, a thing with, with churches called Difficult Dialogues. And we've been talking uh, in uh, previous shows about the church coming alive and standing up to some of these issues we see today. And why is that dialogue so difficult in the church? <laughs> <laughs> well, is it, it difficult topics or difficult yeah. people to wake up? Well, I, I, maybe a little bit of both. I, I think, you know, really what we see, especially when we're talking about LGBT issues today uh, and the transgender issue in particular, mm -hmm. is that for, for your average person in America today, uh, the only place they're going to hear a sort of a countercultural narrative on these that, that is based in truth, that's based in science, uh, that's based in love is the church. You know, for, for a, a child today in public schools, you know, they're not going to hear, all they're going to hear is a celebration of these things in the public mm -hmm. schools, in the media, in movies. Um, and so what we want to do is come alongside churches and help them engage in this conversation in a loving and grace-filled way, but also in a way that's based in truth, that's based in medical science and, and not be afraid of these issues. Truth and love. Amen. I mean, truth without love is brutality. That's and right. And love without truth is just a lie. Exactly. And, exactly. and we're, we're looking at these, uh, you, you look at the situation right now with, with pushing the agenda of the left. Mm -hmm. And it seems like the church is the target. Yeah. Uh, why, why is that? You know, I, I think, well, first and foremost, and, and this is something we talk a lot about, our, our mission at Citizens for Community Values is, our mission field is the public policy space. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Just like a, you know, a homeless shelter is to, to serve the homeless or the addicted or, or you know, battered women. Uh, but we also need to recognize with everything we do, there's a strong spiritual component. Uh, and, and so we very much see a lot of the targeting coming at the church uh, is predictable and there's a spiritual aspect to it. And so we don't want to be blind uh, to the realities of, of what we're facing. Is there a fear of crossing the line though? I mean, I, if, if I'm a pastor in the pulpit or I'm leading a Bible study or I'm out on a, a stump in a, in a public park, is there, is there a fear of crossing the line and being labeled? You're a hater. You, right. you hate women. You hate gays. It's just, is there, is there a fear of being labeled that? Well, I, I think you do see that fear in a lot of churches where they, they want to try to keep, uh, keep doors and avenues open to share the gospel at all times. Um, what we see, though, especially you look at the churches that are growing, they're the churches that aren't, uh, that aren't shying away from the truth. Now, they, they want to be grace-filled in how they present mm -hmm. it. They want to be loving. They want, they want their LGBT neighbor coming into their church to experience the grace and love of Jesus Christ. Uh, but they're not hiding away. They're not ashamed of the gospel. They're not ashamed of the cross. Um, and really what you see more and more is you see a lot of these. You, you're hard-pressed to find a liberal megachurch today. Uh, or a liberal church that's thriving because at the end of the day these leftist liberal churches they're life coaches and people will eventually look at them and be like why do I need to come to this church in the first place everything they're saying I can figure out on my own let me be a good person let me not you know steal from people I, I kind of got that figured out uh, that's all I need. Yeah. I always kind of laugh at the dichotomy of, of the left yelling that the, uh, the right is science deniers when it comes to the global warming or global change, yeah. <laughs> and yet we look at we look at a baby in the womb, or we look at somebody who says, "I'm I'm non-binary. I'm not a man or a woman." And the denial of science, the Bible and science are, I mean, science is there because the Bible. Exactly. No, that, that's exactly, science just reveals more of God's beautiful and magnificent creation. That's what we see time and time again. And that, that really is, you know, when, when we talk about the, the, the transgender issue in particular, um, we, we, we say, and, and, and not to be too graphic, we say it doesn't matter what you cut off or remove or put on biologically, genetically, you cannot change your sex. You know, your, your, your sex is hard-coded into your DNA. It, it, talk, we, it gets into your bone yeah. structure and your muscle density and, and all of these things. I mean, it, it, it is much more than, than, you know, what makeup you wear or what clothes you put on or what surgery you get. Uh, it, it's so much more than that. And that's just basic science there. That, that's not even, a, we're not even talking theology at this point. <laughs>
Yeah. And, but it's denied in, That's in a right. lot of cases. They say, That's well, you right. can't say that. You can't tell me that. And I don't know how many genders there are now, technically, but <laughs> I've always counted two. That's right. That's what the Bible's always shown us. No, no, yeah. that's a, and that's what creation has revealed. I mean, even too, when you just look at um, what the, the function of gender, the function of sex uh, is reproduction. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, that's a binary act. That's a binary uh, creation to make. So what, would you, what do you challenge the churches to do? You know, really what we want to challenge churches on is first and foremost, make sure you're in an environment where an LGBT person could come in and pursue the grace and love of mm -hmm. God and then be challenged just like you and I need challenged every day sure. to grow and be sanctified on the blood of Christ. Uh, but then, but also equip the saints. You know, we really see with, uh, with children today especially, but even parents, they're getting bombarded every day by t being celebrated. You know, the culture is calling good evil and evil good. Mm -hmm. And things, people in your church that you might think are solid and would, would never accept this, they have real questions. And the question is for, that we're bringing to churches mm -hmm. with this difficult dialogues conversation is are you creating an environment uh, where people in your church can sincerely ask these questions and get real answers? Yeah. And you mentioned the schools a couple of times and what kids are he hearing in the schools. Is that, a, is that indoctrination, is that overt? Is that just, has that just grown? It, yeah, no, we, we, we genuinely do see it as overt in many ways where, uh, you know, they're, they're outright talking about how they, uh, the, the, their sort of LGBT sensitivity trainings or, or their, what they're doing with sexual, what they would call comprehensive sexual, sexual education today. Uh, it's very clear. And it's one of the reasons why for CCV, we're big advocates for school choice, for private Christian schools, for homeschooling. We're not anti-public school. I went to public school. Mm -hmm. Um, but as of right now, there needs to be accountability in public schools and parents need to be able to say, hey, you're not doing well for my child, so I'm going to take them elsewhere. How do you do that in the public sector? I mean, if you, if you can't afford a private school, you, you want to stay in the public schools or a charter school, how do you do that in the public sector as a, as a, as a citizen? Yeah, so, well, I, I would say first and foremost, getting involved in the school choice movement, fighting for vouchers, fighting for tax credits, those types of things, mm -hmm. so that a parent can take, uh, can send their kid to any school that best meets their needs, regardless of their income or zip code, is a huge part of it. But the other side of it still is, too, it's, it's good old-fashioned grassroots organizing. Run for school mm -hmm. board. Get on the places that hold people accountable. Get involved in the PTA, uh, because so many of these decisions are made through relationship, and if we're not involved in the conversation, our voice isn't heard. Would you like to help expand the reach of Viewpoint with Bob Placey? Then sign in with your YouTube account and subscribe. Do the same on your favorite podcast app. By subscribing, rating, and sharing Viewpoint content, you will help this life-changing media show up on more search engines as popular and trending. If everyone watching right now would do that, Viewpoint would become more visible worldwide to online viewers in places that missionaries can't even reach. Thank you for helping us reach the world by sharing Viewpoint with Bob Lacey. The purpose of Viewpoint is to discuss the many questions people have about the Bible and how we can find answers for today's difficult problems. And we appreciate the amazing response we've had on the show, including being recognized by the International Christian Film and Music Festival as the best TV show. Viewpoint is produced totally from the financial gifts of viewers like you. So we'd appreciate you continuing to support this show by making a donation to WTLW.com. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you next week on Viewpoint.